Welcome, Sean Copland, to this um, episode of the ICA Health and Wellness Committee. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Okay. Um, before we start, let me just introduce you uh, to the listeners and the, um, and the viewers. Uh, Sean Copland uh, combines performance and pedagogy and entrepreneurship as he navigates today's dynamic music industry. He's an associate professor with the Lionel Hampton School of Music, where he also teaches Alexander Technique and Entrepreneurship. There he performs with the Northwest Wind Quintet and a Hammers and Reeds Trio, both resident LHSOM ensembles. He is currently the co-director of the Stetson University Clarnet Clinic and a resident Alexander Technique teacher for the Eastern Music Festival. He has played with the Washington Idaho Symphony, Greensboro Symphony, Winston-Salem Symphony, North Carolina Symphony, and the Orlando Philharmonic. He has held management positions with Walt Disney Entertainment Inc. and the Greensboro Opera Company. Sean is a performing artist for Buffet Crampon, Gonzalez Reeds, and Silverstein Works. He is co-author of Embodied Mapping for Clarinetists and Breeding for Clarinetists, both of which books are set to be published later this year. So again, welcome to this episode, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our topic is the Alexander Technique. So let's start with the most basic question. What is the Alexander Technique? That's a great question. Um, the Alexander Technique is a process that you can use to help reestablish your natural, easy coordination, the coordination that you had as a child. Um, the person, Alexander himself, uh, made a very important discovery when he was struggling with his voice in the early turn of the century. Um, he was losing his voice when he was performing and no one could figure out why. And he discovered, he pointed at a whole body mechanism for coordination that no one else had identified um, to that date. And even now, we're still working on trying to, to point at it, to find it. We know it's there, um, and we know that it works because we know that the experience of it is true and lots of people have benefited from studying it, but we can't yet put our finger on what it is, but it is some mechanism that allows our whole body, our arms, our spine, our legs, our head to coordinate in movement um, so that our body moves as freely and as efficiently as it can. And the Alexander Technique helps us reestablish that um, because through life, through life's experiences, through our habits, through our beliefs, through our culture, we interfere with that coordination in little ways along the way throughout our life. Um, and this, this technique is a process of discovering how you have interfered with your coordination and learning to reestablish that, that internal connection that uh, facilitates easy coordination and easy movement. Thank you. So what you're saying that some of the habits, uh, actually what we learn throughout our developmental uh, progression, those might inhibit or interfere with natural um, movement patterns they, of life? They, they often do. Um, actually, any time that you try to do an activity um, and you think about how to do it, like specifically move your hands this way, move your arms this way. Like think about, think about the instructions that you tell yourself to do a golf swing or something like that. Like your feet have to be a certain way and the angles of this and you have to bend this way. And anytime that you approach any activity with that kind of thinking, that kind of sequential step-by-step, -step, I'm telling the individual parts of my body what to do, you are almost 100% interfering with the coordination of that. And if you stepped away from trying to manage all those itty bitty parts and just focus on hitting the ball from A to B, 
your body would coordinate in the most efficient way possible for that to happen. And it will okay. just, it, it will do it on its own. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, how is Alexander Technique different from other somatic educational branches such as Feldenkrais, body mapping, and I can, the list can go on. Yeah. Um, body mind centering. Yeah. The, it's, there's, there's so many. Um, the, the truth is they're all, they're all very closely related. They're all trying to get to the same place and it's just a different pathway into that to that place of us, the individual recognizing that we are not a mind and a body or we don't have an emotional body and a physical body and a mental body and a and an energetic body like all of these different ways that we divide ourselves up none of those are true we are a whole body all the time and alexander's uh, approach to to getting to that whole bodiedness that whole body connectedness um was was through at the time his head neck and spine um which which at the time he believed was the entry point to this this coordinating mechanism that we call the primary control or the primary movement um that relationship that coordinating relationship between the spine, head, and arms, and legs. Um, for, for Alexander teachers, we traditionally start somewhere in this region and work out from there. Um, okay. There's an, the, the second thing that makes it extremely different from everything else is there's a piece of it in the process that we call inhibition. Um, that doesn't mean what Freudian inhibition means. In the Alexander Technique, inhibition means to simply pause and hold space between your habit and the new thing that you want to do. To just pause in that space and make a choice to do the new thing. And that is something that is in many ways unique to the Alexander Technique, that the idea of I'm going to notice my habit. I'm going to pause and redirect, redirect my attention to do, to do something different than my habit. Absolutely. I've had um, quite a bit of experience with body mapping as well as Feldenkrais, and I have not been told about inhibition in those sessions ever. But um, in Alexander Technique material, whether it's reading or, or audio or, or video, uh, inhibition comes up quite often as, as, as a technical way of thinking through how we're going to move. Yeah, the, the, um, I'll, I'll borrow a word from my students that, that I use more and more these days. Um, the, the process of inhibition allows us to have a meta awareness of what we're doing. We, we're, we're not only aware of, of on a granular level of what is happening, but we're aware of something way, way, way up here in the mental process of, I could do this, but instead I'm going to do this. And so you're, you're directing your activities at, on two different levels. Um, and you get a real, uh, you know, what I often say is like, you're getting a, you're getting a 10,000 foot view rather than a sea level view. Yes. You know? And so yes. you, get, you get a bigger picture of, of truly what's happening. Absolutely. So when, when you perform, do you think about uh, what you do or you just go by what you have uh, practiced? Um, I practice, uh, I use the technique pretty much all the time. Um, but particularly when, when, I'm, when I'm thinking about it the most is when I'm practicing so that the process of using the technique is built into the habit of the piece that I'm playing. Okay. Um, you know, so often I will, I will think, you know, if I have to come in on a, on a, you know, altissimo note, pianissimo and kind of ease in for me, I'm thinking 
free the neck, free the neck, free the neck, and there comes the sound. And it's always that process so that when I get to the performance in those moments before that note, I'm not going, oh, oh, oh God, it's not gonna come out. I'm going free your neck, free your neck, free your neck. And then, you know, because I've worked that process into the performance of what I'm doing. Okay, so it all makes sense. It's all layered together so that it, in the performance, it's not a separate thing. Absolutely, okay. That's valuable information. Um, so we, you mentioned why why we need Alex and the technique, obviously, <clears throat> to bring back our uh, natural movement patterns um, and into our profession as well. Um, what are some of the specific, specific to the direct positive influence of uh, Alex and the technique on clarinetists in general? I'm talking about blowing, breathing, maybe a, a posture or, or hand movement or arm, maybe articulation. Yeah, so so I'll talk about, and for this I'll talk about sort of the global things and then something that's very, very specific to clarinet playing. Um, from a global perspective, everything that you just said, embouchure, finger technique, articulation, use of air, movement of air, all of those things are are contingent upon the way that the body is organizing in the activity of that. If you don't understand how your body works to balance and how it is continuously balancing all the time, then all of those other functions are going to have some level of interference with them um, because you're diverting resources to trying to keep yourself upright because you're not allowing your body to balance in the way that it's designed to balance. Um, and so right off the bat, just helping someone begin to understand how we, how we organize and, and balance, um, where the center of gravity is in our body, how does weight get distributed, uh, distributed through the spine, into the legs, if we're sitting into the chair, into the ground, if we're standing, you know, what role do our feet and our knees and ankles and hips play in, in how they stabilize our body and allow our body to be free for these activities. Um, you know, if we don't understand that, then we're most definitely interfering with it, um, which is going to spill over into being able to move your fingers, being able to articulate correctly, being able to get air in and out of your body. Um, you know, but in, in that regard, particularly if you're using torso muscles to stabilize yourself, those, those muscles are over your ribs. And so if they're activated while you're trying to stabilize yourself, then you're constricting the rib movement, which of course is then constricting the, the way that your body brings air in and out of your, um, of your lungs. So there's that, you know, overall holistic, you'll just be a, you will feel better in your body. Therefore, everything that you do will be better and more efficient and easier. Um, specifically for clarinet players, as a clarinet player, we're, we're always working to achieve this high tongue position. Um, and, and allow that the shape of the tongue to come up in the back um, and forward. Well, it, it turns out that <clears throat> the, the reason why Alexander made this discovery was because of a problem with his voice. What he was doing was pulling his head forward and down um, or back, it just depends on how you, how you look at it, or back and down. Um, but he was shortening his stature, and you can even hear the change in my voice as I do this. Um, what happens when you, when you pull and shorten your stature, you have a set of muscles that attach to the underside of your skull and come down and drape down to the bone that's right here called the hyoid bone. And these, these muscles 
create a suspension system for your hyoid, which also then creates the space and is the, the muscular structure of the inside of your mouth and the back of your mouth and the back of your throat. It turns out that the hyoid bone is also the base bone for all of the muscles of the tongue. When, when we're working in our stature and our body is lengthening and that coordinating primary movement is working for us, our heads are moving up and away from our, our hyoid bone, which then means that these, these muscles have gone taut and they're, they're pulling the hyoid bone up, which is where it needs to be. And when we bring our head forward and down, these muscles shorten and the hyoid bone drops, which means the back of the tongue drops with it. So at that point, if you're, if you're coming to the clarinet like this, you're now working a certain level more than you need to. There's a residual tension in your tongue because you're working against what your body is trying to do. The, you know, the hyoid bone is pulling your tongue down and you're trying to move up against that. So you've got this built-in resistance that you don't need. Um, and so basic things like, like tongue placement are going to be affected by this, which of course then means you're gonna have residual tension in the back in the middle of your tongue, which is going to affect your articulation. So it becomes this kind of, um, this affects this, which, is affects, which affects this. When we get this going, those muscles pull the hyoid bone up with them and the tongue is now suspended in the way that it's, it's meant to be suspended. And now it's free to move um, in, in everything, in speech and clarinet playing and everything that we do with it. And I wonder if bringing the base of the skull forward, like you mentioned that, and showed it if that actually restricts the windpipe to some degree, uh, brings that of angle or out of natural straightness. It, it certainly does. It can it constricts it, and also just because you know our not not necessarily our trachea because that's a cartilaginous hard structure, um, but the the space between that and our embouchure is all soft tissue. It's all muscular wall that collapses when our head comes forward and down um, or back and down, depends on how you, again, yes. depends on what your point of orientation is. Yes, absolutely. No, so you're, thank you. you're constricting the airstream in a way that you don't want to constrict the airstream. Now, my question, um, as you mentioned the word balance quite a few times, when we talk about balance in somatic education, uh, what sort of balance are we talking about? You know, the natural balance so that we don't fall to the ground or, or a different kind of balance? That's, that's a great question. Um, I, I, have, I, have Sorry. Very, I have very strong <laughs> opinions about this question. Um, this just came up in our training session uh, just yesterday. Um, so the truth is your body is always working to balance. If it wasn't, you would fall over. But there, there is no such thing as the, the place of balance or the, the point of balance or a, the balanced posture. There is only in balance or balancing. It is present tense and future tense. It is never past tense. Okay. And, and really what we're doing is we're continually moving towards equilibrium. The body is continuing to, to try and find equilibrium, but equilibrium is, is also in motion. It continues moving forward. So it's this perpetual movement towards something that's also in motion and we can never actually get to it. So pretty much stating the inverse or the opposite a, a, a balancing position or or poise can be a stationary pose 
cannot be. It, it cannot, right? it is not stationary. It is, it is balance or, or it being in balance or balancing is a movement. Um, and in fact, there's no such thing as stillness in your body. You are only still in two instances in your life when you're under anesthesia and when you're dead. So every other, every other moment in your life, you're moving. Um, might as well stop trying to hold yourself still in order to create stillness, which we might the balanced position. We just need to move away from that. Um, and, and a lot of that comes, comes with uh, shifting our language away from using words like posture um, and using more active words like, are you balancing? Are you poised? You know, are you in poise? Do you feel active and ready for movement? You know, are, are you engaged to, and ready to move? Absolutely. Um, yes, some time ago, actually, that was quite a few years ago, I read an article and I believe it was um, written by Barbara Carnival and um, the Horn Professor of uh, Biomapper. Oh, it just escapes my name. David Nesmith. David Nesmith, thank you. And in that, they discussed a little bit. They mentioned what balance was, and uh, they wrote down it was the bone to bone relationship in the body. So the way two bone re well stood in relation to each other, which made me really think back then what I had thought about balance and what that would mean to me having read that part. And it's interesting when you think about that bone to bone relationship, it involves always joints right in the body. And those joints are very flexible and those are the, those, those, those are ways the body upholds us right through the muscles. So <clears throat> that that was a, an eye well, an eye opening or revelatory moment for me back at the time mm -hmm. um, to think about balance. That um, our our anatomical knowledge has moved considerably more forward from that point. Um, you may remember, gosh, maybe about four or five years ago, there was there was this big announcement that scientists have found a new organ, the inner sedum in the body, and they think that it is the water pathway that tr that cancer gets. Um, uh, that cancer moves and spreads through the body. And it was hilarious that, of course, they immediately had to link it to something so negative. But what they, what they finally identified um, is what somatic, educator, ed, somatic educators have been talking about for 20 or 30 years, and that is the role that fascia plays in our bodies. We used to think that it was just a single layer of of sticky connective tissue that was between our muscles and our skin. But we now know that fascia is a complete internal web, a three-dimensional web of, of sticky, connective, stretchy um, uh, material that goes through our muscle tissue, through our bone tissue. It wraps around our joints um, and, and encases our entire body. So it's balance is actually your skeletal system working in concert with your muscular system, which is also working in concert with your fascial system, which is also being coordinated completely all by your nervous system. So it's all of that happening at once. Um, if it were purely the bone to bone connection we wouldn't be able to move because as soon as as soon as we walk, those bones are no longer on top of each other. They're now like this, and so what what stabilizes the joint when it's in a different when it moves through its range of motion? And the truth is that our joints stay are stable in any point within their range of motion because we the balancing system is built around 
the skeletal system, the muscular system, the nervous system, and the fascial system. So they're all working together. Okay. So that leads me to the next follow-up question. What is then, because when we talk about nervous system, we can differentiate between two. Nervous system one, we can coordinate, the other one we can't, right? Um, how much can we coordinate of what we want to, what we want to do uh, when it's the whole movement and whole balance, uh, balancing uh, a topic goes around the nervous system? So the, you're, you're talking about the two nervous systems that you're talking about. You're talking about the central nervous system. Yes. Uh, the, the spinal cord and the peripheral. And the peripheral, nerve. yes. That, that, you know, basically coordinate large, gross movement. Um, and then the other nervous system that you're talking about is the, uh, the autonomic nervous system, which we, we can control it indirectly. Um, it, but in terms of, of what we can control um, from, a, from a movement standpoint, um, in some cases, we have the ability to control muscles all the way down to individual spindles within the muscle. Um, but the real question is, why would we want to? Our, our movement is so complex that trying to, tr trying to control movement down at, at that level of specificity we're just gonna we're just gonna injure ourselves and there there again is why the alexander technique is such a beautiful um process for what you're talking about because it it activates this this coordinating process within the body that once it's going all you have to do is is say i need to get from here to there and my body moves across the room beautifully without, without any effort versus me thinking, okay, I'm going to pick up my right foot and set it down in front of my left foot. And now I'm going to shift weight through like to, to, to try and move at that level of granularity, what you end up doing is holding everything else still and tight while you're moving the one thing that you're paying attention to. Yes. And the, the, the part of our thinking that we do that with is not powerful enough to coordinate the complexity of our movement system. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that kind of a technical thinking, I call it a technical thinking, and then uh, there's musical or expressive thinking, right? When, when all the technique organize themselves towards that musical expression or idea. Yeah. And there's, there's great, there is great value in dropping down to that level of, of granularity in your thinking for a moment, like sit in front of a, a mirror and really watch how does this finger move. And, you know, and once you get it, then come back up away from it. You know, we can concentrate to such a very, very fine degree. The problem is we're taught to concentrate all the time and to move from one point of concentration to the next point of concentration to the next point of concentration in a very linear fashion. And our, our attentional system, our nervous system, our brains, they're not designed to do that. We're misusing our brain in that way. And it, it's extremely costly to us. It wears us out very quickly. You know, when you come back out of that level of granularity to 10,000 feet again, inhibition, um, you bring with it everything that you learned down at that level of specificity. You just add everything else back to it. Absolutely. And so you have a, you have a full view. Absolutely, yes. When you're on a stage, you don't want to think about tongue position, right. um, finger movements, right? Right. When you want to enjoy a painting, you, you're not going really close to see those strokes. Right. Right. Large strokes. You want to go a step back and look at the whole. Yes. <clears throat> and that's that is probably the greatest gift of Alexander 
work is that it, it connects us back to that, that part of our nervous system that allows us to do that with our movement, to not have to direct at, at a, a high level of specificity. Absolutely. Um, how did uh, the Alexander change the way you teach and, and perform? Um, that's an, that's an interesting question to, for me to think about. Um, I, I will say, you know, honestly, first and foremost, that my training with Alexander Technique happened at the same time as I was getting my doctoral, um, were doing my doctoral work and my, my idea of pedagogy was was forming at the same time um, as I was learning this. And so they, they melded together. There wasn't really a point where I went, oh, I'm going to stop doing what I'm doing and now do something different. Um, what, I, what I see in terms of, of what I do compared to how I was taught, um, in most things, I believe that when I when I have a student in front of me and a student is struggling with something or there's you know having difficulty with something, um, I believe that that on some level there is a belief or um, an idea in there that was valuable at a certain point in time, but is no longer working well for that person, and it's my job to to start asking questions and get the student to talk to me. And eventually the, the piece of it that is causing confusion will reveal itself. And then we just pull it out and the whole thing crumbles. And then we, you know, we put it all back together again. Um, you know, we call that a mismap or a, a mapping error. Um, I, don't, I don't use those terms anymore. Um, I just think it's it's just old information and it's time for an upgrade. Um, but that's probably one of the, the biggest distinctions in my teaching is that it's always a process of discovery to try and figure out why can't I do this? You know, there's something, there's something in my in the way that I'm organizing in my movement that's preventing me from, from doing this. Um, it's also firmly established the idea for me that uh, that our work is is something that we do over a long period of time and what's important is that we just do the work every day the same way um, you know we we have we give ourselves the same the same amount of time to do the same process we don't try to cut corners with things, you know, um, I, I tell my students all the time, play your scales for an hour every day. If you get through all 24 or however many you're supposed to play that day in 10 minutes, great, do them again and do them again, slow the metronome down, speed the metronome up, play with articulation. It doesn't matter. It's not a question of of I play until I can play them all right. It's I play my scales for an hour every day um, because that's the work. Um, and that's also probably the biggest change um, that it's had in my playing is it has really taught me the, the importance of routine um, and and the value of paying really close attention to what I'm doing in that routine. That, that that's really my fundamental core. And that's where I'm thinking the most versus, you know, I just use my scales to warm up. I just play, you know, I check out and I just play them because it's the 560th time I've played my scales in my career. Like, no, each time that I do those things, it's new. 
It has to be new. There has to be something different that you trick your brain into paying attention to it and not checking out and not being in habit. Um, we, we really want it to be, to be fresh and to be present. Um, I'd say other than that, the, the other distinguishing change for me in terms of performing was it really taught me the, the value of expanding my awareness beyond my body into the space um, and mapping the space that I'm in as, as being in movement with me, meaning that you know I, I'm in the performance hall and the people in the audience are in the, in the same space that I am in. We're moving together in the same space that I'm performing in and I'm directly connected to the audience. Um, rather than pulling myself in and making myself small. Um, that's, that's a concept that dancers and actors do really, really well. But um, musicians, it's not one of our, it's not one of our, our best things that we do. Um, but we could really benefit from letting our attention expand beyond our body. And that may sound woo-woo-y, it's not. You do it every time you drive a car, you know? Yes. Um, I remember an oboe player <clears throat> that came to give a master class a couple of years ago. And when she did so, she, she told us a, a story about her um, going to a audition the day before the actual audition. It was back up in Canada, and um, and she went to the, the the Philharmonic Hall, and she actually started practicing on stage where the, uh, the audition was going to be performed. And she said, well, eventually she she won the audition. She she, she came to be the first overest of the the Philharmonic Orchestra, but she said that was that was her her luck that she could she she could be there a day before she could. Uh, imagine the the space. Imagine how she needs to play. Imagine uh, um, the um, uh, audition committee in front of her, and just be there. And she wasn't shocked the first time when the actual audition came up. She was already familiar with that space. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. <clears throat> um, what do you see in today's uh, clarinet players? of generally bad habitual characteristics or performance techniques that we deal with mm -hmm. um, and how can the Alexander technique help with that? Mm -hmm. um, one of the first things that we, that we have to pay attention to and where we can be of great assistance is in how you bring the instrument to your body how you organize your body around the instrument. Um, we want to continually remind ourselves that the instrument comes to us and comes into our mouth, that the instrument doesn't stop at some place and we bring our body to the instrument. We, we will bring the body or we will bring the instrument to our body wherever our body is. Um, and, and in most cases, we may think that we're doing that, but then if, if you know we get a snapshot of us from the side, from the profile, we see, oh, we're, I'm still sticking my head forward. Like um, the, the, the body and, and our nervous system plays a trick on us. It normalizes whatever we do as habitual, um, as, as a habit, it, our body normalizes that so we don't feel it. So you won't even notice that you're two, three, four, five degrees off of center um, because you do that all the time. And so your body has just accepted that as normal. And then when someone brings your head back to center and brings the clarinet all the way up to that, you feel like you're falling backwards but you're right, in, you're right in the center of, of 
your body. Um, there's lots of things with just how to hold the clarinet. Um, you know, there, there's no right way to hold the instrument because every single person on this planet has a different set of hands. Uh, and therefore, each person has to find their own way to hold the instrument. There is no one way to teach that. And an Alexander teacher can really do some good work with that and help a person move away from what they think they're supposed to do and help them find what they need to do for their own body and for their own structure. Um, in terms of breathing, my goodness, um, we could have a whole nother, we could have a whole nother podcast on that. Um, but Alexander was known early in his career as the breathing man and doctors would send patients to him who had emphysema because he could rehabilitate their breathing system by changing their coordination. And the same is true for clarinet players. Often breathing issues, problems in breathing are actually a symptom of an organizational problem in the whole body. Um, but because we haven't addressed that, we try to fix the problem on the level of breathing with all of these metaphors that just simply don't work. Um, I said earlier that our movement system is so complex that we can't control it with our thinking. Our breathing mechanism is 10,000 more times complex than our movement system. Um, and we just, we don't need to try and control it. We don't, we, we shouldn't. And I think that's what Alexander or any somatic educational branches teach that we don't want to be in control of things. We're going to go with the natural, right? Right. right. How we, how it's designed to move and work. Right. You have you have all the tools that you need in your DNA. You were born, you were born with the ability to play the clarinet. You were born with the ability to sing. You were born with the ability to do all of those things, um, just because you're human. So just, yeah, it's part of our DNA. So uh, then can the AT help with all sorts of an ailment uh, from a per performance perspective? Or there are some limitations to Alexander technique as well, what it can and what it can't help? Um, so the Alexander technique is an educational process. It's not it's not a healing process or a therapeutic process. It can certainly be used in therapy, um, in physical therapy, in mental health therapy, um, but a person who's doing that is dually certified. Um, as an Alexander teacher, we are not, uh, we're not certified, we're not trained to take on that type of responsibility. We are, we're a teacher. Um, where Alexander Technique really shines is when it's used in conjunction with therapeutic techniques. For instance, if a person is recovering from tendonitis or carpal tunnel syndrome or some other um, overuse, misuse injury, um, it's very helpful to, you know, you see your physical therapist and they give you exercise to strengthen and to help recover. And then you see your Alexander teacher who helps you figure out what it is that you're doing that's causing that. If you, if you just simply heal, when you go back to the activity, you're gonna hurt yourself again because you haven't figured out what you're doing that's causing the injury. The injury is not that you're playing the clarinet. It's it's how you're playing the clarinet or how you're swinging the tennis racket or how you're typing on the keyboard. 
it's the quality of that that movement itself that's causing the problem, not the not the keyboard itself or the clarinet or the instrument or or the activity itself. Um, and so we really shine when those two things come together and and the student both recovers and then prevents the injury from from returning. Um, in terms of of kind of specific things, Alexander Technique is really wonderful for chronic pain, um, neck chronic pain, lower back chronic pain, anywhere in the body, really. Um, it's very effective for soft tissue injuries, so tendinitis, um, nerve, uh, nerve pain, such as thoracic outlet syndrome, cubital tunnel syndrome, uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, it can be very helpful in helping someone recover from and prevent uh, spinal injuries, such as ruptured discs um, or pinched nerves. Um, in conjunction with physical therapy, it, it can be very, very helpful. Um, it can also be very help, very helpful in unlocking personal creativity. It's not just a thing to use to fix problems. It's actually a, it's actually a technique that you can use as a creative process rather than a, a reparative process. And that's, that's when it really gets fun as a, you know, uh, that's when I really enjoy working with someone is when I don't have to fix them. I now can teach them to use the technique to be more, you know, to, to unlock more of their own self and the availability of their self in the art that they're doing. Um, that's, that's what makes my job wonderful. Yes, uh, th that sounds like that. This is unlocking the treasure box and actual the actual door to the, to the full spectrum. Yeah. Of Alexander technique, you know, <clears throat> without any limitations. Absolutely. So if you if you if you want to be better at tonguing, we want to be better at expressivity. We want to be better at a finger technique, or we want to be better at breathing or holding. Um, those those can be applied as well with yep. the Alexander technique. And and if you want to be a better teacher, um, you know, it, body mapping and Alexander technique combined, man, you can diagnose issues in playing really quick. You know, it it, it it's actually just fun. <laughs> You know, yeah. Um, I can attest to that. Um, so, my next question would be who are the licensed educators in Alexander Technique? And what do they offer in terms of artist courses, classes, private lessons, master classes? What uh, uh, webinars or any other co collaborations. Mm -hmm. um, a, a a licensed Alexander teacher is referred to as a certified teacher of the Alexander technique. Um, a a person who is certified has been through a a fairly rigorous training process. Um, it is usually three years, and it's twelve to sixteen hundred hours of work. Um, over the course of those three days, uh, th th three years. Um, so it's, it's highly skilled. Um, Alexander teachers, what you could expect with working with an Alexander teacher, um, they're going to use their hands with you in a one-on-one -on -one private lesson um, to gently suggest ways of moving for you. Um, it's not manipulative and it's not like a massage or anything like that. It's it's just very, just light touch and guiding. Um, in terms of, of what a teacher can offer, um, teachers offer private lessons, um, which is a great way to work. Um, and there's lots of different styles of teaching within, you know, there are some teachers who teach in a very structured way, and there are some teachers who teach in a very improvisatory way. 
Um, I was trained to be improv. Um, my, my mentor was an improv actor and dancer and she kind of threw me out in the middle of class and said, go, go teach. You know, I was like, oh, okay, uh, you know, I'll figure this out, you know. Um, uh, teachers often offer group classes, master classes. Um, we call them group lessons. Um, but they're exactly the same as, a, as what musicians call master classes. Um, there, there is a growing body of online material that is the result of the pandemic. And it's probably one of the greatest gifts to our field is that our, our field finally sort of embraced online opportunities. Um, there was a huge divide at the time of uh, coming into the quarantine and 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 limiting our limiting our ability to be effective through the quarantine and then eventually our, our field embraced online activity and so you can find webinars and podcasts um workshops completely recorded workshops now um that are available to you so there's just a ton of resources out there there are two organizations of Alexander teachers in the United States. Um, the first is Alexander Technique International. Um, and that is an international organization, but it's very present here in the, in the United States. And then there's the American Society for Teachers of the Alexander Technique. We call it AMSAT as an abbreviation. Um, both of those websites have uh, the opportunity or the, the the resource for you to look up a teacher in your area. Um, because the training is so intense, there's, there's not very many of us. There's probably only a couple thousand teachers around the world. Um, and they're, they definitely gravitate towards the more urban areas. Um, you know, there's probably 150 teachers in the greater New York City area. Um, but there's two in Moscow, Idaho. Um, but you can, you know, you can find a teacher on there, and many of those search engines actually have um, ways to uh, specify. Like, I'm looking for somebody who knows how to teach musicians, um, <clears throat> or I'm looking for a dancer, or I'm looking for someone who who works in a very specific way of working that I want to go study with them. Um, I would encourage anyone who's who's interested in in studying Alexander Technique to take a couple of, of introductory workshops. Um, if you're fortunate enough to be at a music school where they have an Alexander class, even if it's not in the music school, if it's in the theater department or the dance department, go take it. You'll learn a ton. You'll learn more from the people who aren't musicians in the class than you will from the other musicians that are around you. Um, and it's so much fun. Um, and and find a private teacher and take a couple lessons and even, um, even work with two or three di different teachers at a time to kind of figure out what's the style of, of working that you're, uh, that's gonna resonate with you. Because we each teach through our own experience of the technique and through our way of working with the technique. So it, it's, um, there's a huge variety in, in the field. Which is, which is very nice. Diversity is always a strength, even in teaching style. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so if someone contacts somebody uh, from the uh, Life Certified Alexander Technique um, educators and has a minor or a major issue in performance, let's say a clarinetist, um, is a could be could it be approximated how long how many sessions it would take how long that minor or major uh, performance problem um, it would take to overcome um, those difficulties or is there any timeline for it or it is very 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 individual it's individual but there you know there's some commonalities that that you know hold true um, you will likely experience, 
a huge light bulb moment in your first lesson. You'll leave that first lesson feeling better than you've ever felt before. And then eventually, a couple hours later, your body will forget that and you'll be back to your habit. Um, and it will take two to three lessons before you kind of figure out what's going on and figure out how to, how to connect to those experiences and, and have those experiences for longer periods of time. Um, I'd say usually around six to 10 lessons is, is about the time that you figure out what it is that you're doing and what it is that you want to change. Now, at that point, you're working with your own neural function. Changing a habit, is, there's no like, uh, there's no go practice this for three days and it will be fixed. It, it could take three hours, it could take three days, it could take three weeks, it could take three months. It's a, it's a matter of, of how often do you think about it and how often do you choose to do the other thing? The more often that you put your attention on acknowledging the thing that you don't want to do and choosing to do the new thing, the faster that patterning is going to, to work its way into your daily habits. Um, so it's a, you know, just depends on how much you practice yes. it. Um, you know, I hate to be the teacher that says that, but, but it, 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 it's a matter of how much time you devote to the work when you're doing your work. Um, you, you know, that will, determine, that will determine how, how long the changes take to make before they become more permanent. Yes, absolutely. Um, we already talked about, um, some sp specific examples where Alexander Technic can help a clarinetist or performers, but we haven't really talked about materials you mentioned that there are some online materials more and more nowadays but what would be some of the literature <clears throat> recorded audio or video materials that you you think would be very helpful for either first-time listeners or even uh, for those that have or they have heard about the Alexander technique and have read some um, uh, materials um, that they can dive into or, or keep reading yeah, um, the, there's, there's a couple of books that I um, always send people to um, right, right in the very beginning. Um, the first is Body Learning by Michael Gelb. Okay. Um, it's, a, it's been out for a really long time. And I think that uh, a new revised edition recently just come out or it's about to come out. Um, but it's an excellent introduction to the technique. Um, the explanations are clear. They don't go on for a very long period of time, but the, the examples are clear and easy to grasp. Um, from there, I send people to the Conable um, text, How to Learn the Alexander Technique. We call it the Green Book. Um, by Bill Conable, William Conable, and Barbara Conable. Uh, after that, and, and incidentally, that is also the, the, the basis of knowledge for body mapping. Um, and really does a great job of explaining the role of body mapping within Alexander Technique and how body mapping helps the learning process for Alexander Technique and assists in the learning process for Alexander Technique. From there, I recommend that people go to Pedro de Alcantara's book, Indirect Procedures. Um, Pedro is a fabulous uh, Brazilian cellist uh, and a beautiful, spectacular Alexander teacher. Um, and his book is written for musicians. Um, 
and addresses specifically the, the things that musicians go through. Um, those books, those books will get you started. I do not recommend to students, to anyone interested, that they read Alexander's books. They are difficult to read. The reading style is, is early 20th century. Um, it, it's a lot of run-on sentences, um, uh, circular sentences. It just, it, it's just very difficult to get through. I mean, there are far better books um, that are clearer uh, YouTube has an amazing array now of Alexander videos and uh, uh, examples of private lessons and people teaching. Um, I think that it's worth, those are, some of them are really great and some of them you might look at and go, I have no idea what's happening because it just, it often when you watch someone work, it looks like they're doing magic. Um, you know, they just put their hands here and everything changes and you have no, if, if you're just watching it and you don't know what's going on, it just looks like you just performed a miracle or something, you know. Um, so it, I think it's helpful if you have read at least some of those books so that you can then go, oh, oh, that's what they're doing. They're, they're, they're leading the person out of their downward pull. You know, you have a context for what you're watching. I would not go to the videos first. Um, but there are some really great ones out there. Um, there is a there's a web series called um, something like Body Learning um, or Whole Body Learning um, that is now uh, on their podcasts that are now on YouTube um, that discuss various topics through the lens of the Alexander Technique, like injury recovery and um, performance anxiety, practicing um, recovery, lots of, you know, just lots of specific topics. Um, and finally, I'd say alexandertechnique.com. It's a database of articles and they it's organized by topic. Uh, so you can find, you can if it's written if it's been written you can find what you're looking for on that on that site okay thank you and we i'll send you a uh bibliography as well absolutely so these um materials or either either or the uh, the metadata or the link will be provided with the uh, recording mm -hmm. on the website Thank you, um, Sean. I think we've touched on all points of Alexander Technique uh, that might be very interesting and beneficial for the Planet community and more. So, well, we are grateful for your expertise and time you've taken and also for accepting the invitation to this yeah. podcast. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled that you asked. I'm honored that you asked. Humbled. It was Absol my pleasure. Absolutely.